Hello friends and welcome to Zionville. We are here, finally, time for a new beginning. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we begin. Lord, we thank thee for another opportunity to come before thee to study thy word together with you. May you be glorified in the things I say and in the thoughts and intents of the heart of those listening. We thank thee in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We are here, finally, time for a new beginning. As I go about my daily routine, one of the things I have to do is go out shopping. On these trips, I'm confronted with hundreds of people in the food stores, big box stores, and all around outside. On nice days, the crush of people can be very overwhelming at times, if you're in a city, that is. Fortunately, that's rare for me anymore. But even more so than that, it is most overwhelming to me to realize that most of these folks do not have any idea where they are, where they are going, nor what time it is that they are about to be confronted with the judgment of God and are not at all ready because sin still reigns in them, and this is foreign to most of their minds, all of it. They just go on and on, as they always do, never realizing that sin is all pervasive to them and that repentance is a necessity that cannot be put off. They can't afford to do that. They think everything is fine with them, and especially so for the youngest generations. Long ago, this was prophesied. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Amos 8, verse 11. They don't want to hear the words of the Lord. As a result, when troublous times intensify and they begin to wake up a little bit, it will be too late for most of them. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even unto the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. Amos 8.12 Probationary time will close fast, and they will be left outside of Christ and present truth. To, the, to this they have been tending for quite a while. That too has been written in the scriptures of truth. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3. This is what bothers me immensely as I see all the unaware people while out on my urns, sitting ducks and so hard to reach. There have always been false doctrines and heresies throughout the centuries of Christianity. Paul spoke of this fact in Acts 20, verses 27 to 31. The apostasy, falling away from the truth, started early. But there has never been a time when things are so universally bad as in our time, the time of the end. And we are now near the end of that since it began in 1798, a time when people, especially the well-to-do, think their religious culture is just wonderful. We are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Revelation 3, 17, Clause A. What a deception. Paul says that Christians, Christians, will not endure sound doctrine. The Greek word for endure is anekomai. It means to put up with, to bear with, to sustain. And Paul says they will not endure, put up with, bear with, nor sustain biblical truth. Sound doctrine will be hated in favor of fables. These they will wholeheartedly accept, along with all their pleasure-seeking. Don't forget that part of their error. The bringers of these fables, Paul explains, the teachers that confront the itching ears of the hearers, that's who they are. These teachers speak pleasing things that the people want to hear, fables, speaking to those who don't want to listen to the often hard things that God has to tell us. But we need to hear them. And these folks follow their teachers with little or no desire to dig deep into the Word of God for themselves to find out what is truth. This is a fatal condition to be in. Such folks just go on and on trusting in men. At the end, they will be lost, except they repent, of course. Probation is still open for all as I write this, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. One of the biggest reasons people feel this way today is undoubtedly Calvinism, among those who have had some Christian background, false though it may be. 
This theology tells people that once they come to Christ, that's it. They are saved and cannot be lost. So most people who believe this, and that's virtually everybody today in virtually every church, have no desire for deep personal study. They see no need for it. They're going to heaven, and nothing can change that. So why spend laborious hours poring over the Bible, history, doctrinal history, and so forth? Why bother? What a drag. And besides, the big game is coming on the TV. They reason they don't need to know any of these things for themselves to have a heartfelt experience in them because they, hey, they're going to heaven regardless. That kind of study is for the theologians, the pastors, and, God forbid, the hierarchy. Thus, they become the sheeple of these men alone. Too often, it's the blind leading the blind, and thus they are bound for eternal death with absolutely no idea. And then, when faced with truth, these dear folks fall, full of traditional or tradition, will fight you tooth and nail over it. They know little of its true bearings, that is, truth, and don't want to know, as Paul predicted. They'll even say that sometimes. I don't want to hear it. Very sad. And the awful thing is that most of these folks we are talking about are fine, upstanding, wonderful people. They are our family and friends whom we love. We do not want to see them deceived and lost at last. But to get them to listen, how? What is needed, of course, besides the personal study we have been discussing, is true humility. Each of us needs to come to the point where we honestly realize that we are undone and powerless in and of ourselves. We need to realize that we need God's wise counsel continuously. We must grow in grace. Just saying you're saved is deadly. We need continuing counsel and growth in grace. That continuous counsel is found in the Bible, not tradition or shifting creeds, and proven by the record of history, much of which was unfulfilled when the Bible was written. This we call prophecy. It is very important to grasp prophecy in its true historical bearings, continuous historicism. This is also upended nowadays in favor of Jesuit-inspired sidetracks, preterism, and futurism. One of the things that should be obvious is that we would have no Christianity without the Bible. It all comes from there. It wouldn't exist otherwise. We do not get real Christianity from the traditions of the pagan nations, not if we want it pure, that is. Only the errors come from the pagans. So I'm talking real Christianity. But men then, as now, want not the word. History shows the fulfillment of prophecy and the confusion of Babylon, the aggregated churches of the last days, that has come down to us through the centuries as to what God's revelation in Scripture means. Babylon has its own ideas. And most people, if they do anything about looking into biblical truth at all, flock to them. And the ducks are still sitting. Doesn't it make sense, then, that we all get back to the Bible individually to find the answers instead of resorting to popes, pastors, politicians, assorted teachers, and so forth, jumping from one flea-bitten dog to the next? This is not to say that some of these sources never speak any truth, no. But most of them, most of the time, are way off base, especially in these last days on the things that count most now. And this is deadly for us. This is why we must get right with the Lord, be obedient to him, and seek his faith as we study his word. We need the Spirit of Christ for ourselves to guide us safely home. Nobody will be saved in groups like our church or that other church or his followers of brother so-and-so. Unfortunately, this problem is rampant among even one true God believers today. There are so many ministries split up all over the map and some teaching demonstrably false doctrines. And once we do understand things and change, repent, we can then truly help our brother and anyone else we come across as Christ enjoins us to do. This is why I am so excited about the Seventh-day Church of Revelation and thrilled to be a part of it because these are our goals. They're our goals. The Lord is heading for the home stretch and wants to take us with him. Please watch this video. This is the way, as inspiration shows us clearly. Who are you, who are you going to believe? Stop the playback to copy down the URL so you can watch this later. 
So it should be easy to understand that when properly equipped and obedient, we will be able to do marvelous things to hasten Christ's return. No more independent atoms. We must lay all that is false aside and work together now. We are all ignorant sinners on our own. This, there is safety in the multitude of counselors. As Scripture says, we are all, as it were, in the same boat. We all need the enlightenment of God himself, not the darkness pervaded by Satan since the great controversy began in the heavens billions of years ago. This earth was created only 6,000 years ago to settle that rebellion. Let us make a pledge to God and each other to adhere to him and what he says. Wrong understandings of theology, the fables, can be discerned and must be dropped from our minds and lies. When this happens, our lives will truly glorify God. And in this way, you and I can actually hasten the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter tells us to be careful concerning what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for, the hasting, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. 2 Peter 3, verses 11b to 12a. And the messenger of the remnant enlarges on that in these words. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Christ is waiting for, with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. And when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not to only look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.12, margin. Were all who profess his name, Bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly, the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, paragraphs 1 and 2. We cannot reproduce the character of Christ in ourselves while holding on to false doctrines and practices, including Romish, Romish theology in any form, for the simple reason that there is nothing false in him. Jesus is coming soon. Maranatha.